you'll take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I know you thought this was the last night in Mark, but I decided to switch it up a little bit. We are going to look at the same passage from a different angle, okay? And Rubuni uh, Ditalai, or Shinsai Yabangdi, Zidal, is a young woman, the Fanghi Fangfa, okay? They get a camel and they move. Uh, uh, if you've not used our translation method yet, we've made a little video that we'll play in just a moment and we'll show you how to access our translation program. We know some of you are having trouble scanning the QR code, so this will help you out. And uh, hopefully you can see that. You go to our little website on your mobile browser, taishangif.org. And I know you won't be able to listen to me while this is happening. While they were 
marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, it's a good reminder for us, Jesus sees inside of our hearts. He knows everything we're thinking and everything we're doing. Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. That's the Father. For he who is least among you, all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Have you ever said that to Jesus? Have you ever said, Jesus, I will do whatever you ask me to do? This could be you. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no birds. Another one said, uh, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. It's a It's a harsh thing. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another one said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one, no one, did you hear that? No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word. Three things I want you to see. Three things. In order to follow Jesus, you need three things. First thing is this. You need a new first. You need a new first. We're going to start at the end of the passage and work our way back. Let's look at verse 57. You need a new first. We see three people in this very last section who, it seems, were willing to follow Jesus. This seems like a pastor's dream, right? Hey, who's willing to lead a Bible study? Who's willing to help me out? Who's willing to help me? Oh, I'm willing. I'm willing. Oh, this is great. I mean, these people were willing. Jesus should be jumping for joy, right? But Jesus' response to them is not exactly what we might expect. Let's look a little closer and see if we can figure out what's going on. The first person says, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied to this guy, lets us know that he's able to discern something. He's able to see something that we're probably not seeing. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is Jesus saying? I see that you have a home. You have possessions. You have things. You have a certain standard of living. Are you really willing to lose those things for me? My friends, what about you? If Jesus 
calls you to follow him, are you willing to lose those things for him? Are you willing to lay them down? The second person, their concern is for their family. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. The third man, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those of my home. Listen, there's nothing wrong with their desires to go and take care of their family concerns. But what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus discerning here? Jesus says, for you, my friends, it would be a bad idea. You're saying that you want to follow me, but do you really understand what this means? Notice their language. Jesus catches it. Lord, first let me go and do this. First, let me take care of this. Then I'll follow you. No, my friends, there is no other first with Jesus but Jesus. He is first. He is the only first if you choose to follow him. Jesus says, I must take the first place before and over money, career, family, your father, over all these things, over all else where you cannot follow me. Okay, now we're beginning to see what this is coming. I'm not sure that Jesus would have had a very large church. Honestly, right? The last verse, Jesus says, no one, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What's he saying? Well, in Jesus' day, he used a lot of farming metaphors. Okay? It, it makes sense, right? So imagine in those days, the farmer would have had to have held the plow handle being pulled by the ox or the, um, what's that called? A bull or a cow or whatever. Okay? And as he's holding it, the metal piece would be digging down into the ground. What's he talking about here? What's he saying? When you plow to fill, you had to pay attention. One reason was to keep the rows straight. If you didn't have straight rows, imagine how hard it would be to take care of your field. If you're just, you know, doing this kind of thing. The other reason be to watch out for the rocks. If you're plow, listen, to get a piece of metal made that would function as a plow would cost a lot of money. And if you hit a rock and broke your plow, it would devastate your crop. There could be no distractions. There could be no competing thoughts. And what Jesus is saying is once you put your hand to the plow, you must stay focused. Jesus is saying in order to be my disciple, you make a choice like the farmer, to focus, to be disciplined, to finish. Nothing else can compete for your attention. To be fit in this situation, in this sentence, doesn't mean to be qualified. It's not qualified because, listen, none of us are qualified. That can't be what Jesus is saying. We're qualified by God's grace. All of us get into the kingdom by grace. It meant that unless we give ourselves totally to Jesus, then the power of God's kingdom doesn't come isn't able to flow fully through us, completely into us, and out of us, into the world. It won't be useful to God, is what he's saying. That's what he's saying. But perhaps the most shocking statement in this passage is this. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. What is he saying there? That's so harsh. What's Jesus saying? Well, first of all, the first dead in the sentence can't be the physical dead. It must be the spiritual dead. What Jesus is saying in this leads to see and acknowledge who Jesus is, and then reject the call to follow Jesus is to be as blind, deaf, and dumb to spiritual realities as a physically dead person is to the physical realities. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. It means that to see and acknowledge who Jesus is. Listen, this could be you tonight. If it is, I'm begging you. Wake up. You can see who Jesus is, you can acknowledge him, and you can walk away and remain spiritually dead. It's like being a dead person trying to acknowledge a physical reality. Can't be if you say, I believe in Jesus, but first, then you're not following him. Uh, I, I want to have some fun. I want to wait until my parents die, then I'll believe in Jesus. I want to wait till 
My parents understand at least, then I'll believe in Jesus. First I have to get, you know, my sow my wild oats. I gotta take care of some things first. First I need to make some money. First I need to have my career. First I need to get my life in order. Jesus is saying, if you understood who I was, if you really got me, you would have no other firsts. I wouldn't be first. That's what Jesus is saying. What's Jesus saying? Yeah. What's he doing here? So, uh, have you ever watched one of those medical TV shows? Well, I think we all probably have. Or maybe you've seen it on the news, or maybe you've just been to a tra CPR training where they use a deep, for, for, deep I can't say that word, deep fibrillator. Thank you, defibrillator. Do you know what a defibrillator is? It's a big battery, like a car battery, okay? And you hook it up to a person because their heart is stopped. And then you push a button, and you know what it does? It sends electricity through your body. You should never do that if you're living. I told you a story before where I stuck the pliers into the electric plug. Okay. If you weren't here, it's a, you know, don't do that. You should not send electricity through a living person because that will stop your heart. But if you send electricity through a dead person, it can start your heart. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's using the defibrillator. He's trying to shock you. He's trying to wake you up. Spiritually dead people, he's saying, wake up. Wake up. Come alive to the reality that he is the reality. We think this world is the reality. And it's not. It's all. It's not as real as he is. He is the reality. Listen, back in the first part of the scriptures, what did he say? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory, and the, when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and his holy angels. That's reality. That's reality. But we've kind of created this idea that this is all there is. No, my friends, it's not. He is the reality. I remember listening to a sermon years ago, and the person said something like this. I did a little research this week to update the facts. So I just want to, maybe, maybe this will help me. Consider the distance between the Earth and the Sun. You know how far that is? It's about 93 million miles. 93 million miles, that's 150 million kilometers. Okay, 150 million kilometers. Because of the Hubble Space Telescope, we now know that the number of galaxies in the visible universe are like blades of grass in a field. That's how many there are. You cannot count them. There are so many. The estimate that researchers come up with, and I don't know how they come up with this, because I don't know how you count this, is 40 billion galaxies. 40 billion galaxies. Who, who did that? Not one, two, I, mean, I don't even know. How. If you count a small slice, obviously, then you go flat out. Can I just try to bring this into perspective for you? Imagine that the distance from the Earth to the Sun would be like a single sheet of paper, like this. Okay? So this is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Using this scale, the nearest star to us which is 4.3 light years away, would be a stack of paper 71 feet tall. Okay, if this is the distance to the sun, the, the, the comparison would be a stack of paper 71 feet tall. That's 21 meters high. Trying to do both, like both uh, metric and the star. The diameter of the Milky Way galaxy, which is where we are, okay, you science nerds will love this. Okay, the rest of us are all going to love this. The diameter of the Milky Way, which is 100,000 light years across, would be represented by a stack of paper 310 miles high. 310 miles high. While the distance to the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the one we can see with our eyes without a telescope, 
that two million light years would require a stack of paper more than 6,000 miles tall. 6,000 miles tall. Do you feel pretty big right now? You shouldn't. You should feel really small. On this scale, the edge of our universe would not be reached until the stack of paper is 31 million miles tall. In real miles, that's only a third of the way to our sun. The Bible says in Colossians 1.16, for by Jesus, by him, all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Can I ask you two questions? Is this the kind of person you ask into your life to be your personal assistant? Because that's what most Christians person you call to do things for you, to fix things for you. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe who is holding infinite amounts of galaxies and space together by his very power, without even thinking about it. Our atoms and molecules are existing. The best thing you can is to get away for an hour. Put your phone away. Put your computer away. Put everything away and just be quiet and think about that prayer back. And then think about whether you should follow Jesus. So the first thing is you need a new first in your life. You need a new first. Let me tell you, he is the only first. There is no other. The second thing is this, and I'll try to move through these two points very quickly. Following Jesus is not just about going in a new direction. It's not just about going in a new direction. Once you have a new first, it actually makes in you a new form. You are transformed. Notice what Jesus says in verses 23 and following. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save him. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose or forfeit himself? We talked about this a lot last week. So if you weren't here last week, I really encourage you to listen to the sermon online last week. Jesus here is not specifically talking about your physical life, although it does include you. He's talking about your identity, yourself. In the Greek, the word is related to your psyche yourself. There's specific words, and so that's how we know this. I think what he's saying is that the world's way of gaining an identity must die, and his way of giving you an identity must be born to life, must come to life. In Eastern religions, okay, those of you who grew up in, on the Eastern side of the world, and some in the West, okay, I'm not trying to totally break this apart, but I need you to think about this. The way that you find yourself is to lose yourself. Okay? Think about that for just a second. Buddhism, Taoism, and Eastern religions, you know, in many of them, at the end, the way that you find yourself is actually by losing your identity and becoming one with the great whatever that is. Okay? You just kind of meld into the great one thing. Jesus says in order to find yourself, lose yourself. You actually gain a self that is your true self. But the Western way is flawed too. The Western way, what's the Western way to find yourself? We always talk about in the West, we kind of say, well, I need to, I need to really find myself. We take selfies now, you know. Do you find yourself? Have you found yourself in your selfie? I don't think we found ourselves in our selfies. The Western way is to do this. We look for our deepest desires, our deepest wants, our deepest needs, and then we think if we can fulfill those, then we found ourselves. 
problem is our deepest desires, our deepest needs are always changing. What does my deepest want right now, 10 years from now, can change. So actually, we're never fulfilled. We're never satisfied. Jesus shows us that the ordinary way that we gain a self is this way. He actually shows us in the text what's happening in the last three guys. You are somebody if you have a family. You are somebody if you have a husband, a wife, kids, parents who approve of you. Here's how the world works. You gain something, and then you are somebody. And Jesus says, this is the normal way. But Jesus says, even if you were to gain the whole world. Listen, did you catch that? Even if you got it all, you'd still be lost. You'll lose. Jesus says, only if you lose yourself for him, then, then and only then will you have a true self. Because you were made to know him. You were made to be built around him, for him to become the center of your life. Then you'll have your true self. How can you do that? How can you do that? Last point. You must go through the fire. Did you catch that little weird part where the disciples go to that town and they reject Jesus and they come out and they say, do you want us to call down fire? What is that? That is kind of a weird little aside, it seems. Because they don't, that's not normal. You know, I mean, even for the disciples, they didn't go around calling down fire on where would they get the idea of calling down fire on people? I mean, Jesus never called down fire on people. That's not nice, right? I mean, I don't think that's nice. But all of a sudden, he gets rejected by these, this little village, and they're like, I think we should roast them to a crisp. <laughs> no, that's terrible. And Jesus, of course, rebukes them, right? Okay. You, you, that's why I read this whole passage you have to read the whole passage in order to do this. They just came from the Mount of Transfiguration. Where who did they see? Elijah and Moses. If you go back to Elijah's life, and believe me, the disciples knew the Old Testament. Elijah was the one who called down fire. There are two places in the Old Testament where Elijah called down fire. 1 Kings 19 and 2 Kings chapter 1. In 1 Kings 19, it was the battle between him, between, not between him, but between God and Baal. In the second one, the wicked king sends some men to go and get Elijah and bring him. And Elijah's kind of up on top of this mountain. And the king sends 50 soldiers to go and get him. So the 50 guys show up at the little mountain, and they're like, we're coming up to get you. And Elijah says, well, if I'm the man of God, let fire come down and burn them all. And kaboom. You should read this. It's, it's crazy. And they're burned to a crisp. So some people who saw it go back to the king, and they're like, uh, we didn't get it. He says, all right, 50 more. 50 more go. Burned to a crisp. He sends 50 more. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. The, the third group, they got wise. They were like, uh, Mr. Elijah. Would it be possible for you to join us with the king? And you know, so they didn't get burned up, all right? That's why the disciples, I think, and a lot of commentators think, are at this point saying, Aren't they rejected you? Burn them to a crisp. Not the right way. And of course, Jesus rejects them. But listen, to reject Jesus, pretty serious offense, my friends. You should not reject Jesus. What's going on? A little bit later in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth. He has come to cast fire. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. He's already been baptized, but the fire has yet to come. What's going on in the Old Testament? People would bring their sacrifices to an altar. And those sacrifices would be burned with fire. Friends, on the cross, Jesus is 
burned with the wrath of God for you. For you. The wrath and fury of God, this is what most people really never understand about the cross of Christ. It wasn't some symbolic act. It wasn't some, you know, well, he's just a good guy trying to do the right thing. No. Jesus on the cross was destroyed, utterly destroyed, to pay the sins on your behalf. He was burned up. So you didn't help him. And now, how is it that you can be transformed? And we go through the refining fire of God by looking at Him, by believing in Him, by trusting in Him. And we are refined, we are purified by remembering, by thinking about, by considering. And it is transforming to us from the inside out. The trials of life, the troubles of life, all those things are God's way of forming us into His image. Oh, how we need it. A couple of weeks ago, I had this nasty habit of getting angry while I was driving. I was with my wife and my son, and we had gone to watch an event. And I pulled up at a particular place, and I, I got really angry at a couple of parking entities. And it kind of become a habit. And I'm really thankful I have a really great son, a really great wife, and also a really great daughter. And they called me out on it. And they said, Dad, uh, how, how is it that you can claim to love Jesus so much and treat people so terribly? I dropped them off, and as I was going to park the car, the Lord came to me and said, yeah, hey Todd, uh, I've been trying to tell you that, but you weren't listening to me, so I had to send your family to talk to you. And you know what? It wasn't about, that, that's, that is what it was about. He said, do you love me? Do you love me? And I, I began to remember that this stuff. This is how it works, right? This is how we're transformed. I didn't think about you, honestly. I didn't think, wow, I should change so I can be a better pastor. I thought, I love Jesus. I love him. I don't want him to be disappointed in me. I don't want to honor him with my life. I can't continue to treat people like this. And take the name of Christ. So God began to reform me. There was some fire. There was some fire. So thank you guys for saying that. I appreciate it. I hope you have people in your life who are able to speak to you like that. There's some fire. We need Holy Spirit, church, we are fire that God uses to form us and help us to put Him first. You need it? You do. We're about to take this table. This, this is another fire that God uses in us to remind us to turn towards the cross. And after we finish this table, we will pray for each other. Fire. We pray for each other. We confess our sins to each other. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another. Why? So that you may be healed. Need healing from your sins? I do. So we confess to each other. That's how you get healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we want you to be first. But sometimes our formation is really lacking. So we need to fire. Thank you that you don't just burn us up, burn us to a crisp like the disciples wanted to do that day. But yet you bring the healing fire, the love of Christ, up close to us so that we're reshaped and made into your image.
So then you are first. Thank you, Jesus. We all need this time. We ask for it in his name.